Alcantara. Help protect Alcantara. Help protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. Oh, Alcantara. Help protect Alcantara. Help protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. In 2017, the Alcantara Youth Camp Historic District was determined eligible for inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion A for its association with the early development of Alaska's correctional system following statehood. The Historic District contains four contributing properties, the Alcantara Youth Camp Main Building, the Alcantara Youth Camp Mess Hall, the Alcantara Youth Camp Log Cabin, and the Alcantara Youth Camp Totem Pole. Properties not contributing to the historic district include the Alcantara Youth Camp Dormitory, the Well House, and the Alaska State Defense Force Garage. The Alcantara Youth Camp was established in the 1960s and operated as a correctional facility for Alaska's male youth until 1976, at which time it was transferred to the Alaska Army National Guard for use as the Alcantara Readiness Center. John Alcantara was essential to the opening of the 320-acre youth camp and his efforts led to the funding and construction of a permanent mess hall and barracks, as well as the establishment of a permanent facility for boys within the youth correctional system. John Alcantara was born on September 20, 1929 in West Virginia. In 1949, Alcantara hitchhiked with his best friend from California to Anchorage via the recently opened Alcan Highway. This is the road through the brooding wilderness. This is the wedge which has pried open the last great frontier of America. The original plan was to invest in a claim stake with the intent to prospect for gold. When it soon became apparent that this was not a feasible option, Alcantara began working for the railroad. It was while he was working as a lineman for the railroad based out of Curry, Alaska, that Alcantara met and married his wife, Patricia. He was a lineman for the railroad, uh, putting up the, the lines, you know. And um, he was up on the line, and I said to my dad, who is that guy up there on that line? And my dad looked up and said, oh, that's Alcatraz, because he couldn't remember his name. He called him Alcatraz. So anyway, so that's where I met him. The couple had nine children together. During the Korean War, Alcantara secured a position as a fireman for the railroad, which had a lasting impact on his draft notifications. Between changing locations from Curry to Anchorage and the value of his position as a fireman, his draft number was called three times and deferred twice, until he eventually served as a fireman on Elmendorf Air Force Base. The family had a farm on Tudor Road, which at the time was on the outskirts of Anchorage. When one of their neighbors moved to Barrow, the Alcantaras took over their stock of 40 chickens and established themselves first as Valley View Poultry Farm and later as Totem Eggs. During this time, Alcantara became acquainted with Governor William Egan through his position as a state representative. Governor Egan began to rely on Alcantara to make introductions during his visits to the area. It was through this avenue that Alcantara was made the official governor's aide in the early 1960s. Prior to his employment for the governor's office, he had been actively involved in the public push for a youth facility, working with the Anchorage-based Juvenile Action Committee as early as 1959. The group advocated the purchase of farmland in the Matanuska Valley for the location of a juvenile facility. As aid, he was able to lobby for funds more effectively. When newly constructed buildings at the youth camp were officially open for use, Governor Egan flew to Wasilla for the ceremony and the camp was officially named after John Alcantara in recognition of his work on behalf of the camp. The location for the youth camp on what is now Bogard Road was strategic. The camp provided some degree of isolation for juveniles, 
but within close distance of all the amenities available in Wasilla. In 1962, the camp was transferred into the care of the Alaska Department of Health and Welfare and transformed into a traditional classroom study. The Alcantara Youth Camp was conservation-based, providing Alaska's juveniles with education, job skills, and self-confidence gained through a merit-based system aimed to modify behavior. During later years, summers at the camp included various programs in arts, crafts, and outdoor living. A wood shop located in the main building provided carpentry experience for the youth, who carved the totem pole for the property. The camp also provided outdoors experiences, which included summers where the youths worked for the Forest Service to maintain local area campgrounds and trails. One large project came about in the summer of 1961 when Thomas Branton traveled to Skagway with a group of boys from the camp for the purpose of clearing the Chilkoot Trail for the State Division of Parks and Recreation. By the 1970s, there were three youth correctional facilities operating within the state, Alcantara Youth Camp in Wasilla, McLaughlin Youth Center in Anchorage, and Turning Point Boys Ranch in Willow. A decision was made within the Department of Health and Welfare to reclassify Alcantara into a foster facility, which allowed both juvenile offenders and boys within the foster care system to be placed at the camp. A similar system was already in place at the privately operated Turning Point. In 1972, Department of Health and Welfare received $1.2 million to build a more permanent school at Alcantara, and a large precast concrete school was constructed. During the fall of 1975, staff started to hear rumors the complex would close. And by July of the following year, the facility had shut down permanently and many of the boys were sent home. Those deemed unfit to return home were sent to Turning Point for continued rehabilitation. In July of 1976, the Alaska Army National Guard was given control of the Alcantara Youth Camp, which began utilizing the facility as an armory almost immediately. The main school was converted into office space and an armory was added to the southeast corner of the gymnasium for munitions with the already sturdy shop class area fortified for secure storage. The dormitory and log cabin were converted into office and recreation space, and shops and garages were constructed to store equipment. The Alaska Army National Guard continues to operate the armory and communication and tent arrays and provide support to the office of the Alaska State Defense Force. This is the Alcantara Youth Camp Log Cabin. It was one of the first permanent structures built on the camp for the students to use. It was built in the rustic style of architecture by local designer Frank Crawford, who is known for his tapered corners on his log cabin structures. It was built in the early 1960s and it's roughly 721 square feet. The character defining features include This is the Alcantara Youth Camp Mess Hall. It was constructed in the early 1960s out of four prefabricated units that were pulled together to make one building. Funds for building construction were provided through the efforts of John Alcantara. The Mess Hall's character defining features include This is the Alcantara Youth Camp Mate Building. It was designed by Arthur Bunnell and built in 1971 for use as educational and recreational facilities for the children. Its primary characteristics as a new formalist building are
This is the Alcantara Youth Camp Totem Pole. It's actually the second totem pole that has been on site. It's believed that it was constructed from a utility pole and is roughly 18 feet in height and 47 inches in diameter. It has six iconic figures that were designed and carved by the camp students. From top to bottom, we have Raven, Beaver, Mosquito, a humanoid, an unidentifiable figure, and bear on top of a base that is still coated in creosote and embedded in the ground. The character defining features include Effect. Siding over logs? What? There's only one person for this job. Stop the adverse effect, man. I'm Stop the Adverse Effect Man, and I'm here to stop the adverse effect before it happens. Stop the Adverse Effect Man. Amy, installing siding over logs to protect it from checking is an adverse effect. Adverse effect. Amy, do you know why this is an adverse effect? How could it be an adverse effect? It protects the condition of the cabin, but it compromises its historical integrity. Historical integrity. Physical integrity. Physical integrity is the authenticity of a property's historic identity, evidenced by the survival of physical characteristics that existed during the property's period of significance. The integrity of a historic property is categorized and evaluated by its ability to retain integrity and express significance in accordance with the National Register of Historic Places criteria. There are seven aspects of integrity. These include location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. A property does not need to retain all seven aspects of integrity to be eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. However, it should possess many and usually most of those aspects. Condition. The physical status of a building, its materials and structural systems at the time of observation. This is not to be confused with physical integrity. A building can be in good condition, but lack physical integrity for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. On the contrary, a building can be in poor condition, but retain its physical integrity for inclusion. Adding a window to the mess hall, what? Amy, installing a window fenestration to the mess hall is an adverse effect. Stop the adverse effect, man. Amy, can you tell me why this is an adverse effect? How could it be an adverse effect? Because it alters its historic character. Historic. Character. Adverse effects result when an undertaking alters the characteristics of a historic property that qualify it for the National Register of Historic Places. 
Consideration should be given to all qualifying characteristics of the historic property, including those that may have been identified subsequent to the original valuation of the property's eligibility for the National Register of Historic Places. Painting the aggregate? What? What are you doing? You're painting the aggregate! Amy, painting over the exposed aggregate on the main building is an adverse effect. Stop the adverse effect. Stop the adverse effect, ma'am. Amy, can you tell me why this is an adverse effect? How could it be an adverse effect? Because the aggregate is a character-defining feature and painting over it could compromise its eligibility to the National Register of Historic Places. National Register of Historic Places. The National Register of Historic Places. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 enacted the National Park Service's National Register of Historic Places as part of a national program that coordinates and supports public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect America's historic and archaeological resources. Not the totem! Not the totem! No, not the totem! Amy, stop! Cutting down the totem pole is an adverse effect. Adverse effect. The totem pole is a contributing resource to the historic district. Contributing resource. A contributing resource is a building, site, structure, or object adding to the historic significance of a district. Historic district. A historic district is a significant concentration, linkage, or continuity of sites, buildings, structures, or objects united historically or aesthetically by plan or physical development. Amy, what should we do to preserve this totem pole? What should we do? What should we do? You should go through the Section 106 process. Contact the Cultural Resource Manager at DMBA before doing any modifications to this totem pole. Section 106. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act is a mandatory federal regulatory requirement that requires federal agencies to take into account the effects of their undertakings on historic properties. Section 106 requires all federal agencies to identify and assess the effects undertakings may have on historic properties. The federal agencies consult with the State Historic Preservation Officer and other consulting parties to assess effects a proposed undertaking may have on a historic property. The goal of the consultation is to formulate solutions to problematic actions that avoid, minimize, and or mitigate adverse effects to historic properties. Failure to adhere to Section 106 has ramifications far beyond a single project and is often much costlier in the long run than initiating consultation to resolve adverse effects to historic properties. Undertaking. Undertaking means a project, activity, or program funded in whole or in part under the direct or indirect jurisdiction of a federal agency, including those carried out by or on behalf of a federal agency, those carried out with federal financial assistance, and those requiring a federal permit, license, or approval. Historic property. Historic property refers to any prehistoric or historic district, site, building, structure, or object, including in or eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places maintained by the Secretary of the Interior. What should we do? Amy, installing bollards or concrete barriers would help to avoid those foreseeable adverse effects to the totem pole. What should we do? Stop the adverse effect, man. Amy, 
Let's hand over the Alcantara maintenance and treatment plan to Jean so she could tell us more. Now that we've learned a bit about the buildings and structures on the site, and we've learned from Stop Adverse Effect Man about what not to do, let's talk about what to do. Because let's be honest, we all love Stop Adverse Effect Man, but no one wants to see him. And that's where the Alcantara Youth Camp Historic District Maintenance and Treatment Plan comes in. Since that title is a bit long, Let's just call it the plan from here on out. As you might know, the plan has 343 pages. Hence, we decided to distill that amazing array of information down to 10 things to know about the plan. As you might imagine, this took a bit of time. Actually, it took a lot of time. I mean, a lot of time. I mean, a lot, a lot of time but we did it. So without further ado, here are 10 things to know about the plan. The first thing to know is that if you have questions, the plan has answers. To be more specific, the Alcantara Maintenance and Treatment Plan has 343 pages of answers, which brings us to number two, the table of contents because a great way to find answers is to start with the table of contents. The third thing to know about the plan is that it has lots of information on the treatment of historic properties. And by treatment, we mean just that treatment. Just as a doctor helps a patient to get better by how they treat them, we treat historic properties a certain way to make sure that they stay healthy. To help with that, there is information on the materials found in the buildings and structures throughout the site. Those materials include concrete, metal, paint, wood, and all of those materials have different problems or challenges as they age. And this segment of the plan gives information about the materials, what common problems might occur, and how to treat them. Which brings us to number four the history of the site and its structures. This section is packed with useful information, such as the building details, a statement of significance for each building. Why is it important? What makes it important? It's National Register of Historic Places eligibility status, the physical description, the character defining features, changes over time, and then the floor plans and pictures. Which brings us to number five of things to know about the plan. Building conditions and treatments. For each building or structure, you will find a handy chart. And on that chart, you will see an elevation drawing for each building. And there will be elevations for each of the sides of the building. And that elevation drawing is keyed to images of the problems that were identified during the field investigation. It will include a picture of it. You will be able to figure out where on the building it is. There will be a short description of the problem, and then there will be recommendations for treatments or how to approach addressing that problem or issue. And that brings us to number six. Section 106. Whether you are new to Section 106 or have been dealing with it for decades, this section will provide a short overview of Section 106, what it is, and why it is important in this context. And just in case you want to do a bit of a deeper dive into Section 106 and things like adverse effect or integrity or visual character, also known as character defining features, you will find that information in this section. Which brings us to number seven, the AMP framework. We are a little excited about the AMP framework. 
And if perhaps you are wondering what AMP stands for, AMP is the Alcantara Maintenance and Treatment Plan. And the AMP is a framework for the regular maintenance and inspection of the properties that comprise the Alcantara Youth Camp Historic District. The flowchart, which is part of the AMP framework, illustrates that process. It begins with regularly scheduled inspection, where you complete a checklist, and if issues are identified, you assess those issues using the stoplight method, and then if something is orange or red, complete a cart form. Now, just in case you need that in a little more detail or are wondering where to begin, we'll do another deep dive into more specifics about the framework. The AMP framework begins with the regularly scheduled inspection. During the regularly scheduled inspection, you complete the checklist. The checklist was created to establish a systemized and consistent way of looking at the buildings. The checklist includes just about everything you should need to know, from how often or what time of year to conduct the inspection to what to look at when you do. You will note that on the far left-hand side, there are numbers, and we'll talk more about what these mean in just a moment. It also gives the item or feature or element to inspect, what it is that you should be looking at when it's inspected, the frequency of the inspection, and then a little bar for the assessment using the stoplight method. So let's say you're completing a regularly scheduled inspection, and you discover an issue like peeling paint or biological growth or cracking concrete. You then assess it using the stoplight method. The stoplight method is intended to be a simple and consistent way to quickly evaluate issues identified during the inspection. If you encounter something where there's no issues or everything looks great, obviously that's a green. It looks satisfactory. Let's say you encounter something and it's not an issue that needs immediate attention, but it's something that you want to keep an eye on. For example, if there's a small hairline crack in the concrete, it doesn't seem to be getting any bigger, there's no dirt or biological growth in it, and there's not a lot of opportunities for moisture to get in, then that's something that you just want to keep an eye on. Then there are the things that are red. Those are the things that are unsatisfactory, the things that need to be addressed in the more near term. These can include things like rising damp or life, health, and safety issues. If we go back to the checklist for a moment, when you're inspecting the element and you identify an issue, then you assess whether it is a green, yellow, or red. If you identify something during the inspection that is a yellow or a red, it means that then there is the next step and that is completing the cart form, which brings us to number nine of things to know about the Alcantara plan, the cart form. The cart form stands for Condition Assessment and Recommendations for Treatment. Each building has its own form, and on that form, you will find pictures of the elevation and then a space to write information below. So let's say you identify a problem. Uh, like a small hairline crack in the concrete. You can color or indicate on the elevation drawing where on the building it is, write down the corresponding number on the checklist of where that item appears, write a short description of it, and then any recommendations for treatment. Now, if you perhaps don't have an idea of what the best way is to treat that problem, that's not an issue at all. The main point of the AMP framework is to make sure that that regular and systematic inspection occurs so that problems can be identified and dealt with before they become larger problems. Also included in the cart form is a list of the character defining features for each building. This includes a description of what that element is and then a picture of where you will find that on the building. So there's no need to remember those from earlier in the video or to go back to the report to find them. Those are contained in the form itself. Once you complete the cart form, you forward it on to the appropriate party. And the final thing to know about the plan is that it contains a glossary of architectural terms. 
As you might note, there are a lot of terms to describe historic properties, and they are very specialized. So this glossary you will find right at the front of the report so that if there's a term that you're not familiar with, there's a place to find that information. Like we said, the plan has answers to your questions. Whew, that's a lot. Well, that was our deep dive into the plan. We hope that you found this information useful and that you have answers to the questions that you might have. And with that, we just want to leave you with this thought about the importance of maintenance. Maintenance of any property plays an integral role in protecting the integrity and continuing functionality of the property over the long term. Proper maintenance is the most cost-effective method of extending the life of a property. Wear and tear on any in-use property is inevitable, but deterioration can accelerate when the building envelope is not maintained on a regular basis. So let's do ourselves a favor and make sure that we maintain these buildings and structures on a regular basis so that Stop Adverse Effect Man doesn't need to come for a visit. It looks like my job here at Alcantara is done. We have stopped the adverse effect before it happened. Effect man. Alcantara. Help protect Alcantara. Help protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. Oh, Alcantara. Help protect Alcantara. Help protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. Don't let adverse effects affect their physical integrity, which is just how much the buildings are like they were during their time of significance historically. Don't let adverse effects affect their eligibility to the National Register of Historic Places which is where we want them to be Go through Section 106 Go through Section 106 Go through Section 106 Alcantara Help protect Alcantara Protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. Oh, Alcantara. Help protect Alcantara. Help protect the log cabin, the mess hall, the main building, and the totem pole. Don't let adverse effects affect their physical integrity, which is just how much the building like they were during their time of significance historically don't let adverse effects affect their eligibility to the national register of historic places which is where we want them to be go through section 106 go through section 106 go through section 106